class, you're out on the blacktop, you wanted to be picked to get on the team, whatever the team was. You wanted either to be the team captain so that you could do the picking, or you wanted to be picked by the team captain very early on so that you could be part of the team. Now, to understand Israel, to understand the Old Testament, you must understand that Israel was very conscious and proud of the fact that she was chosen as a nation. But what we want to see today is that Israel's understanding of election, of her chosenness, resulted in some grave misunderstandings about the purposes of God. And that's why Amos was sent from the southern kingdom up to the northern kingdom with what I am calling today some choice words. Because even though in the book he talks over and over about the deplorable conditions of Israel, the theme is not really the condition of Israel, but the character of God and how God must respond to conditions among his people. Because he's painting this picture of the God of Israel that is not like the other gods. He's not a God that can be worshipped by idols like other gods. He's not a God bound by tribal boundaries like other gods. But most of all, he's not a God that will practice nationalism at the expense of his righteousness. And what we will see is that one of the messages of Amos is that your God does not practice Israel comes first no matter what at the expense of being holy. So look with me at the first two verses of chapter 3. They are the key to this whole section. This was read at the very beginning of our worship service this morning. Hear this word, the Lord has spoken against you, O people of Israel. Against the whole family, I brought you up out of Egypt. You only have I chosen of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for all your sins. Now, here is the mistake that Israel made. Israel thought that God was pro-choice. And I'm not using that phrase like it is used today. Israel thought that God was pro-Israel regardless. Israel knew that she had been chosen. She had been elected by God. And election is simply the idea that God sovereignly chooses a person like Abraham or a group like Israel out of a larger company for a divine purpose. And God says... You only have I chosen out of all the families of the earth. Now, God initiated this call with Abraham. And then he announced to the whole world this call when he brought the Hebrews up out of Egypt. So central to Israel's identity as a nation was that they were a chosen people. But their understanding of chosenness degenerated into this idea that election has its privileges. You see, they interpreted chosenness to mean that God is going to be on their side regardless of what we do. They preached God is always pro-Israel. Amos said, no, God is always pro-righteousness. They said, election has its privileges. God said, no, election has its responsibilities. He said, you only have I chosen out of all the families on the earth. Therefore, and look at verse two again from the New Living Translation. From among all the families on the earth, I have been intimate with you alone. That is why I must punish you for all your sins. You see, Far from making her secure, Israel's election, her chosenness under the terms of the Sinai covenant demanded her punishment. 
He brought Israel out of Egypt. He took her to Sinai. And there, the language that was used was the language of a marriage proposal. And God said, would you people like to enter into a covenant with me? And here are the blessings of this covenant. And here are the curses if you break this covenant. And this was very familiar language to the ancient peoples. In fact, oftentimes when you made a covenant, you would take an animal like a a, a cow or an ox and you would literally cut it in half and have the two parties walk in between this animal that had been cut with the understanding that if you break this covenant, what happened to that animal is probably going to happen to you as well. Think about at weddings if we still did this. If we cut an animal in half and and had the bride and the groom walk through it to communicate the seriousness of entering into this covenant. I propose that we should do that to strengthen marriage. And I propose that we should use cats. (laughs) Israel said, I like the idea of the benefits of being married. So she accepted the proposal. She wanted the proposal without having to honor the marriage. So Amos had some choice words for them. And I want to talk about it today, partly because there is a lot of talk in the religious world, even today, about how evangelicals should feel about Israel. And you will hear language like, Well, Israel is the chosen nation. She is the chosen people. She is the elect, the chosen of God, as if God is always pro-choice. No, God is always pro-righteousness. So let's understand some things about choice. First, choice does not assume worthiness. God's choice is always A sovereign act based on his nature, not ours. This is probably not a very profound explanation, but this is how I would explain election. God chooses whom he chooses because he chooses to choose them. It is a sovereign act of God based on his nature, not ours. And Israel, all they had to do was consider her patriarchs to realize God's choice was not based on their own worthiness. Who were the three heroes of the people of Israel? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think about those three. Abraham's choice was not based on merit. He was an idolater before he was called. Isaac's choice was not based on physical strength. Abraham was a hundred years old. His wife was over 90 years old when he was born. They weren't even able to get pregnant except for an act of God. Jacob's choice certainly wasn't based on his inheritance because he was the second of the two boys when God picked him. The point is nothing about Israel's history said, I chose you because you are so worthy. Instead, it is, I chose you because I chose to choose you. He chose to call an idolater. He chose to rescue a bunch of slaves. Israel, their their election, it's always based in the grace of God. Look at one of the clearest passages that teaches this thought in the Bible from Deuteronomy 7 in your own Bible. It says, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples on the face of the earth to be his people, his treasured possession. The Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all the peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you. And kept the oath he swore to your forefathers that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commands 
But those who hate him, he will repay to their face by destruction. God is faithful. God is faithful to the covenant, which means he will be faithful to keep the promises to the obedient. But God is faithful to inflict the curses on the disobedient as well, which leads to the second point, that choice does not imply favoritism. The sound theology of election developed under Moses degenerated into a false doctrine of favoritism. Somehow, instead of being the chosen nation, Israel thought of themselves as the favorite nation. And they had this expression back then called the day of the Lord. You can read all through the prophets about the day of the Lord. Now, what Israel thought of the day of the Lord was that when Yahweh shows up one day, he's going to punish all of those wicked nations around us. But the problem was that Israel was just as guilty of sins for which she expected the other nations to be judged. So Amos says in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10, Proclaim to the fortresses of Ashdod and to the fortresses of Egypt, Assemble yourselves on the mountains of Samaria. See the great unrest within her and the oppression among her people. They do not know how to do right, declares the Lord, who hoard, plunder, and loot in their fortresses. Well, what's he doing here? What, who is Ashdod? Ashdod was one of the great cities of the Philistines. He's saying, I want you to go and get the Philistines, and I want you to go and get the Egyptians, and I want you to come to the hills on the outskirts of Samaria, which was the capital city of the northern kingdom, and he's going to pull back the curtain, and he's going to show these enemies of the people of God the oppression that's being practiced right in Israel. He's going to show them all of the loot and all of the plunder that the rich have taken from the poor and stored up in their own mansions. Now, why is this significant? What did Egypt do to Israel for 400 years? Oppressed her. And during the days when they were settling the land, when the Philistines were constantly coming in, they were harassing and oppressing the Israelites. And they were saying, we can't wait for the day of the Lord to come and wipe out people like the Egyptians and the Philistines because they are so oppressive to Israel. God wants to show these Egyptians and these Philistines what the Israelites are doing to their very own people. The last time I went to my doctor in Norwalk, I was sitting in the waiting room and there was a young boy, maybe four years old, misbehaving all over the waiting room. And the woman was either his mother or his grandmother, I wasn't sure. And every minute, we'll call him Billy, it was, Billy, get down from there. Billy, stop that. Billy, if you don't stop right now, I'm going to spank you right here. Billy, come over here. Billy, stop. And this went on. For 15 to 20 minutes. And little Billy quickly figured out that mama's threats meant nothing. And I could not decide what was irritating me more. Billy's behavior or mama's toleration of it. And I wanted to say, either spank the boy or shut up. <laughs> Have you ever seen a spoiled child who acted like he could get away with anything because he was the favorite. That is what Israel was doing. Israel acted as if God's standards for justice didn't apply to her. Now, it certainly applied to all of the other nations, but not to her. But you have to understand that this is one of the things that made the Torah, the law of God, so distinct to all the other ancient law codes of ancient peoples. It was this point in Torah, the rules are the same for everybody. No one, no one set of rules for the rich people and then another set of rules for the poor people. 
Not one set of rules for this ethnic group and another set for that ethnic group. Not even one set of rules for the king and a different set of rules for the people. That's why, for example, you have a story like you find in 1 Kings chapter 21, the story of Ahab and Naboth's vineyard. Ahab was this wicked, wicked king. He did a lot of terrible things for which, honestly, he deserved the judgment of God. But you have this very weird little story about how he stole one little vineyard and that sent God over the edge. See, Ahab wanted this little vineyard from a man named Naboth. But Naboth told him, you know, it's been in my family for generations and I just really don't want to sell it. And so Ahab just sulked and he pouted about it and he wouldn't even eat anything. And his wife, Jezebel, she was a pagan and she could not figure out for the life of her why he was so upset about this. She just didn't get it because as a Canaanite, she was thinking, you are the king and kings get what they want. So she said, I'll take care of it. So she murders Naboth and gives Ahab Naboth's vineyard. And God's prophet shows up and says, that's it. Because it's about something a whole lot more than a little piece of land. It's about the message that you send that Torah, God's law, plays favorites. That God's rules are not the same for everybody. You see, being a part of the people of God does not inoculate you from the judgment of God. God will not tolerate spoiled children, which leads to the third thought that choice does not exclude discipline. I've chosen you, God said, out of all the families of the earth. Therefore, I must judge you. It's not I will judge even God's children. It's I must judge especially God's children. Israel had a higher obligation to justice because of her election, her chosenness. And God had a morally higher obligation to discipline because of her injustice. I want you to understand that I think one of the greatest weaknesses in the church today is a lack of understanding of the discipline of God. Today, everything that happens negatively is deemed spiritual warfare. Anytime any evangelical Christian has a problem, he automatically thinks, well, the devil sure is messing with me. Nobody even acknowledges the possibility that maybe the assault is because God is trying to get your attention because you are in disobedience. Wasn't that long ago I ran into someone that used to actually attend church here. And I asked him how things were going. Oh, the devil is just going after me, man. I need you to pray for me, man. Then he went on to talk about his job problems and his marriage problems. And he admitted that he hadn't been in church in a long time. Maybe the fact that he's living in disobedience to God currently has something to do with why he's having a tough time in his life currently. Maybe when the Bible says the way of the transgressor is hard, that's actually true. Maybe when you live in flagrant disobedience to God, life punches you in the nose because that's how God set the world up to work. And maybe it was the discipline of God that was trying to humble the young man, not spiritual warfare. Now, please don't misunderstand me. I do believe in spiritual warfare, but I believe whenever life punches you in the nose, one of the very first things you need to do is examine whether or not you are living in disobedience to God in any area of your life. The worst thing that you can do is to justify disobedience to God with the phrase, I I know the Bible says that, but. Or. Pastor, I know what you're going to say, but God does not act without reason. Amos wanted Israel to know that there was a a cause and effect relationship for the coming judgment she was going to receive. 
Go back with me into chapter 3 of Amos again. And remember, Amos is a fig picker. He's a country boy, so he goes to the country for these illustrations. Chapter 3, verse 3. Do two walk together unless they have agreed to do so? Does a lion roar in the thicket when he has no prey? Does he growl in his den when he's caught nothing? Does a bird fall into a trap on the ground where no snare has been set? Does a trap spring up from the earth when there is nothing to catch? What is he doing? He is saying there is a cause and effect for everything in life. If you see a bird in a snare, that means somebody caught, set a snare for that bird. If a lion roars, it means it's actually caught something. And then look at the next verse, verse 6. When a trumpet sounds in a city, do not the people tremble? When disaster comes to a city, has not the Lord caused it? Israel had no idea what she was asking for when she was actually praying for the day of the Lord to come. In fact, we're going to see in chapter 4, Amos says the day of the Lord is going to come, but it's not going to be what you think it is, Israel. God is going to honor his own faithfulness, even if it means discipline. So what Amos does is he says, God is going to destroy everything that you have put your trust in. I want you to notice what he does. Look at verse 11 in chapter 3. Therefore, this is what the sovereign Lord says. An enemy will overrun the land. He will pull down your strongholds and plunder your fortresses. In other words, you've put so much confidence in your military might. You've expanded your military and you have all these great armies and great fortresses. But on the day of the Lord, God's going to tear every bit of that down. And then look at verse 14. On the day... I punish Israel for her sins. I will destroy the altars of Bethel. The horns of the altar will be cut off and fall to the ground. What, what is he saying? You have put so much faith in your church houses. You've got some of the most expensive houses of worship in the world. On the day of the Lord, I'm going to tear all of them down. And then look at verse 15. I will tear down the winter house along with the summer house. The houses adorned with ivory will be destroyed and the mansions will be demolished, declares the Lord. What is he saying? You, you are so secure in your prosperity. You, you think that you are so wealthy that life cannot hurt you. The day of the Lord is going to prove differently. I want you to think just for a moment. Do you know of any country in the world today that has confidence in its superior military in her great houses of worship and her immense wealth? Because if you can think of a country like that, the message of Amos applies. I see politicians today all the time close their speeches with the phrase, God bless America. On what grounds is God obligated to bless America? See, we sometimes carry ourselves like we are a, a strong, mighty, rich, religious country. And we think that God's clearly on the side of America. No. God is on the side of righteousness. He always has been. And he always will be. Israel made the mistake of thinking that their chosenness, their election meant protection. No matter what. What should the new Israel learn from their error? Well, let me close with this final thought. Here's what choice ought to do. Choice ought to motivate the chosen to choose what is right. God says, my people don't know how to do what is right. Please understand that righteousness does not produce grace, but grace is supposed to produce righteousness. God's people not knowing how to do what is right is a contradiction of their chosenness. Israel was chosen to be a light to all the other nations. In fact, you go all the way back to the call of Abraham. Look with me at a passage from Genesis chapter 18. Then the Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation and all nations on earth will be blessed through him. For I have chosen him 
so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised for him. That is why Israel was elected. God chose a people to model to the world what doing right and acting just would look like. And you were chosen for the very same reason. After I preach through the message of Amos, a little later this summer, I'm going to begin a series in the New Testament on the book of Titus. Paul wrote to this young pastor these words. He gave his life to free us from every kind of sin, to cleanse us, and to make us his very own people, totally committed to doing good deeds. So the question that we close with is this. Is God's choice of you and me producing obedient or spoiled children? Let me go back to what I shared at the beginning about being chosen on the blacktop. When I was in sixth grade, there was a guy named Chris Rollins. He was, he was the handsome guy. He was the popular guy. He was the athlete. Now, Chris and I were buddies. Believe it or not, I was not always known for being an athlete. And I remember one time on the field just outside of Clear Lake Middle School, Chris picked me to be on his team for flag football. This was during gym. Of course, Chris was the quarterback. In a couple of key plays during that game, Chris gave me the ball, which actually was a very bright idea because nobody was ever set to guard me. But when Chris gave me the ball, there was no way I was going to drop the ball because Chris had chosen me. That's what you do when you are chosen you you give the one that chose you your very best and maybe it's time for you to pick up the ball and run again i can't believe that jesus christ chose me we're going to pray together but what i want you to do is i want you to ask god to put something on your heart this morning as as we pray I want God, I want you to ask God to put onto your heart something that you know is the right thing for you to do. In fact, you've been thinking about it, but I want it to be kind of brought up to the forefront because we have a way of putting these kinds of things on the back burner. And before we meet again next Sunday, you are going to have to choose to do this thing. It's not going to be easy, but it's going to be right. So ask God to put it on your heart between now and the next time that we meet and then do it. Do it to honor him. Choose to do right.